Well, good evening, everybody. And you will recall vividly from the first of the lectures, a lecture primarily on Bascom and earlier, though, uh, all those who had so much of an influence on the Wisconsin idea. But Bascom envisioned a university that would produce graduates who would have a wide, inclusive view of life and society. Now, over the years, the inclusiveness of the vision has been discussed and often revised. In fact, you may recall that last week, Professor Maynard noted that the Wisconsin idea is centered on the public, but he asked, how is that public envisioned? Who are the we that the vision is to include? One of the intriguing things, and I'm really sorry that all of you don't have a chance to read the intriguing discussion posts and responses that people have been making. For this last lecture, those posts suggest that the topic last week, persons on the autism spectrum, that was not a topic they expected to be addressed in a course on the Wisconsin idea. Some said, oh, I thought that such a course would be targeted to depictions of great people, maybe a few great ideas, but it would be people such as Bascom, Van Heys, and others. But that topic generated considerable interest in inclusion and to the recognition that concerns or issues important for the commonweal, that those concerns are not invariably static over time. Change occurs. The interest in concerns from the public and the democratic order is central to tonight's discussion on food and agricultural systems. No, analyses of food and agriculture are not new at this university. But developments have brought new topics and problems to the fore. In particular, food and agricultural systems in urban areas have generated attention that developers of the dairy industry, whom we've mentioned on a couple of occasions, the developers of the, of the dairy industry could not have imagined that there would be this attention now to urban questions related to food and agriculture. Now the presenters tonight intend for the information they provide to help community-based organizations, city governments, and students at any level to help all of these sectors understand challenges associated with fostering inclusiveness and democracy. Now this presentation, as well as the others, this presentation aims to broaden knowledge beyond what individual experiences can capture and reveal. Back to the discussion post, several people said, I'm really sorry that I've had so few opportunities to interact with people on the autism spectrum or to understand disabilities. But can we ever manage to have all of the experiences, the personal experiences, relevant for understanding inclusion? I don't think that's likely. Hence, we have to think about and rely on the systematic analyses that others undertake, because it is through that, those systematic an, those analyses that our knowledge is broadened, and that broadening of knowledge should contribute to the development of the kind of vanguard that Bascom envisioned. Call again, he had in mind that there would be people going out given the levels of knowledge, of education they had attained, and given the conviction that there would be attempts to improve the commonweal, that's what he saw as the university's role. Tonight's presenters, and you see them listed here, Professor Steve Ventura, who is Professor of Soil Science and Environmental Studies, 
but he's also chair of the Agroecology Project and co-director of the activity on community and regional food systems. I think also of particular interest is the fact that he is leading a current effort to create on this campus the UW, UW School for Urban Agriculture. Professor Monica White, who is from Environmental Studies and Community and Environmental Sociology, has a particular interest in questions about food, agriculture, and issues of justice. In fact, she's the author of a recent book on agricultural resistance and the black freedom movement. Greg Lawless, the food system manager, food systems program manager with University of Wisconsin Extension, from which he's retired, and you know how much I really admire people who are retired <laughs> and still manage to find time for a number of activities. He served in that role, served with extension for nearly two decades on food and agricultural sectors in Wisconsin, always emphasizing how outcomes could be improved to benefit the public. So with these three specialists tonight, our journey continues, for this is a journey on which we have embarked, a journey to understand the use of knowledge and of education to enhance the well-being and keep the citizenry at the center. We'll start with Professor Ventura. Thank you, Professor Merritt. So this is what we're going to look at tonight. Uh, I'm going to uh, pretend that I'm a historian for just a little bit and talk about some of the pre-Wisconsin idea, uh, precursors to Wisconsin idea. Uh, then I'll talk about something called the Community and Regional Food Systems Project and how that, I believe, embraces the Wisconsin idea. Uh, then we'll have Greg talk about a couple of projects in Milwaukee and uh, Monica about uh, her book and about some of her Detroit experiences. Uh, before I launch into that, though, uh, I think it has become more common to recognize that we're gathered here tonight on the ancestral lands of the Ho-Chunk and other native communities that managed this land for a hundred centuries before European settlers and we thank them for sharing that with us. So we're going to go from uh, mad cow, I'm the, the bad cop, to a uh, happy cow as we <laughs> go through this tonight. We will start with uh, the founding of the University of Wisconsin. Uh, it was written into the state constitution. Uh, intended as a great public university. Uh, the first class was maybe seven students or something like that, so it took a little while to build up. It really got a boost in the arm uh, with something called the Morrill Act. In the midst of the Civil War, uh, President Lincoln needed some bribery, if you will, to keep particularly Midwestern and Western states uh, engaged in preserving the Union. And so uh, the Morrill Act was passed. A huge amount of land was transferred from the federal government to states. Uh, one of the express purposes was to endow public universities uh, that became known as the land-grant colleges. And as you can see, uh, this very explicitly called for establishing at least one college where the objective was to train people in agriculture and engineering, education for the masses. This really is one of the fundaments that I believe uh, provides a precursor to the Wisconsin idea. Uh, in 1866, uh, the UW legislate, uh, excuse me, the state legislature uh, adopted the University of Wisconsin as uh, the land-grant institution of the state. Uh, and just to show that 
legislative micromanagement of the university goes back a long, long way. Uh, they actually reorganized the university and created the College of Agriculture at that time. Um, if we move forward to the era uh, when Van Hise and McCarthy were opining about the Wisconsin idea, there were a couple of other very significant federal acts that propelled uh, or supported the Wisconsin idea. Uh, the Hatch Act of 1887 created the agricultural experiment system. Uh, we have, what, 14 of them around the state now that are one of the forefronts of connections between farmers and foresters and the university. The Morrill Act of 1890 uh, created the historic black colleges and universities, uh, the black land grants, if you will, um, and also provided a huge amount of funding for general education, again in the uh, agriculture and engineering sectors primarily. And then in 1914, the Smith-Lever Act created a uh, cooperative extension. And it's important to note that even when it was first created, this was intended as a cooperative effort carried out as a partnership between the federal government, the states, and counties. By the way, this is what you see if you go to the homepage of, uh, or the welcoming uh, webpage of UW and type in Wisconsin Idea. It's connected to agriculture although it is also slightly ironic that this is a very modern farm in 1950. Um, cooperative extension services from the federal perspective are to deliver research information. Uh, you can see in their uh, website uh, essentially bringing vital practical information to agriculture business owners, consumers, etc. In Wisconsin, it has always been considered to be a two-way street. The university doing applied research based on what the extension agents hear as the needs of the people of the state. So there is that communication going back and forth. I'll also point out this picture. Um, extension is been organizationally turbulent in Wisconsin. It was, of course, created around the turn of the 19th, uh, 20th century uh, as part of the University of Wisconsin. Uh, this is David Obie as Wisconsin Assemblyman David Obie testifying before the Kellett Commission in the mid-1960s. The Kellett Commission did a major reorganization of Wisconsin government, including merging the University of Wisconsin with the state college, state colleges to create the University of Wisconsin system. And at that time, extension was moved out of UW, what became UW-Madison, and became a separate organization. And as most of you know, uh, as of two years ago, the Board of Regents mandated that extension be merged back into UW-Madison. Uh, so we are welcoming our brethren from around the state and figuring out how to make this once again part of a, a unified approach to the Wisconsin idea. The land grant system has been immensely successful, uh, at least from the perspective of providing this country with cheap food and stable agriculture. Uh, it, if you look across the country, it is responsible for the many if not most of the tools and innovations that have created the uh, mainstream agricultural system that we have. All of those technologies have consequences though. And I'm just going to let this slide set run for a little bit. Uh, this is a, a lecture series that I do uh, talking about some of the consequences of our industrial type of agriculture, uh, consequences in environment, in farm productivity, in human health, in uh, various forms in the environment, um, ethical questions and so forth, legal questions, and it has implications in our food systems as well. It leads to uh, 
a public health crisis, if you will. Uh, we have obesity in this country that is, uh, at least can be attributed rather substantially to the food system that we've created. And I've stopped it here uh, to point out the irony. Uh, this is a low income neighborhood where one billboard says, pay attention to what you eat. And the other billboard says, and by the way, wouldn't you like some fat, greasy, non-nutritious food as part of uh, your life? So this lecture goes on and talks about uh, alternatives, uh, alternatives in modifying that conventional agriculture, in building more sustainable approaches to ag production, and in what I'm interested in, in urban agriculture. Uh, what uh, my friend, Will Allen of Growing Power calls the good food revolution. Uh, learning to grow food in cities, uh, not just for the food, but for uh, what be has become known as food justice. We had an opportunity to work with Growing Power uh, with a USDA supported grant, uh, became known as the Community and Regional Food Systems Project. Um, big project, uh, again with UW-Madison, Extension, uh, Michael Fields Agricultural Institute, and Growing Power, uh, this big urban agriculture operation in Milwaukee, and lots and lots of community partners. I'll come back to that in just a second. USDA's goal uh, in this grant was food security. Uh, that's a lot of words that basically say poor people have greater risk of hunger and poor nutrition, and children are very vulnerable. That's what we are attempting to address with this project. Uh, like most big USDA projects, it had three required components, education, outreach or extension, and research. Uh, we explicitly included advocacy in this project because we knew that we weren't going to move the dial very much uh, without speaking out about things like food justice. So the research uh, had a, a number of characteristics, uh, systems analysis um, and working. The piece that's most important to me was this, evaluating innovations and promoting successes. People growing food in urban areas are already doing really cool things and it's not been well documented. It's getting better. Uh, certainly I hope that our project helped to do some of that. This is the wonky systems diagram that we use to explain this project as a communication tool. The most important thing to note in it is that that food supply chain is not just driven by the almighty dollar. There's a whole set of values and these particularly come out when we're talking about uh, urban food systems where people are growing food not just to make money but to enhance their neighborhood, to educate their children, to provide jobs for people that have difficult time finding jobs and other social benefits. This became quite apparent when we started working with this wide cast of community partners. Um, there you are a little bit bigger. This project was a $5 million grant from USDA to UW-Madison. Two million of that went directly to our community partners to help them do what they were doing, to allow us to come in and work with them, uh, to learn and grow along with them. One of the coolest parts of this was something we called the Innovation Fund. Uh, essentially in eight cities, ten different projects, we gave the community organizations $50,000 and said, do something that you wouldn't be able to do but for this money that comes without a lot of strings. And just give us the right to look over your shoulder, learn from what you're doing, and hopefully amplify, uh, disseminate the good things that are going on. And so, just very quickly, we had 10 community organizations that did 10 really interesting things. Uh, Walnut Way in Milwaukee uh, enhanced their food processing and storage facilities so that the, uh, the Walnut Way gardens would have, be more effective in marketing their products. Uh, in Detroit, uh, 
Malik Yakini and the Black Community Food Security Network began work uh, towards a bricks and mortar food cooperative. In Los Angeles, they chose to document some of the history of food justice in the local food movement. And it was fascinating for me to learn that this ties directly to the Black Panther movement in Southern California. Uh, in Cedar Rapids, a part of the city that was totally destroyed by flooding in 2007, uh, the city and federal government said, we're not going to build levees that will ever protect this part of the city. And so one of the highest and best uses of that land becomes urban agriculture, growing food for the community. Here in Madison, Community Groundworks uh, had a community orchard project working in the, the low-income neighborhoods of Northeast Madison. Uh, in Chicago, uh, SIFPAC chose to put their funds into tools and products and supplies uh, to support community gardens. Uh, in Milwaukee, the Center for Resilient Cities essentially evaluated uh, city policies and provided suggestions for how to more effectively support urban agriculture. Um, also in Milwaukee, Milwaukee County Extension did a very rigorous evaluation of the potential for profitability in uh, intensive urban agriculture production. Uh, in Boston, a small bodega invested in refrigeration equipment so that they could become a uh, local distributor to other bodegas of fresh fruits and vegetables, improving the nutritional quality of what's available in these uh, little shops. And finally, in Minneapolis, the Women's Environmental uh, Institute uh, used their funding to enhance their urban farmer training program, uh, including demonstrating uh, the planting practices of Native Americans in this area. So what came out of this? Um, to me, the take-home lesson was the Wisconsin idea works two ways, uh, obviously. Uh, we learned that we have much to learn from these practitioners in the process. Um, we also, of course, I believe, have much to share uh, in our science, technology, training, advocacy. And what became quite apparent is that these only happen with extreme care. Uh, trust building, clear communication, shared expectations, recognition of lived experiences, and acceptance of multiple world views. So I'm going to halt there. I think we're going to take questions at the very end after we've heard the three presentations. If you were wondering what that backdrop slide was, uh, that was Michelle Obama digging up the White House uh, backyard to put in a community garden or a, a garden in the backyard. Uh, the current occupant of the White House is a little bit more skeptical about this, I think. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me okay? All right. So my name is Greg Lawless. Uh, just to correct a few things uh, from the introduction, uh, I w I've been at the UW, or I was at the UW from 1992 until last Wednesday, a week ago today. Uh, so 27 years, but a few of those were grad school. Um, and I'm not retired yet, but uh, close, close um, in one year. So um, back on up. So that's my, pr this, is the, this is the project. So I, I actually met both Monica and Steve in the project that Steve just described. I was the project manager. I met Monica in, a, in kind of a basement in Detroit. Do you remember? I, I, I spoke to the board of the group you're gonna talk about. So we're all intertwined. Um, and after that project, I kind of wanted to do another crazy systems project. So we had learned along the way from Will Allen how important compost is in, in especially urban uh, agricultural systems. So, I was driving down to Chicago a lot in the project, and I, I got to wondering what would, how much, Petra, Sven, hey, how's it going? Uh, I was wondering uh, how much food waste does the city of Chicago produce in a year? I just tried to picture it. You know, what was that? What would that pile look like? 
And then I was hearing all this need to improve soil in Chicago, so I was wondering, you know, how does that pile of food waste compare to the amount of soil that needs to be uh, improved? Um, would it, could we just, you know, could we basically improve all the soil in Chicago that's necessary to grow, grow food and, and some other service, you know, environmental services that I'll describe. I never got to study Chicago. It's a very big city. It's two and a half hours away. But I was able to basically take that question to Milwaukee um, and wrote a SARE grant. SARE is a Sustainable Ag Research and Education grant. They're very competitive. It was very, I was very lucky to get it. It's a, it was a two-year grant. We stretched it into th the money into three years. Uh, but this is kind of the subtitle of my talk, if only we could act like a system. So having uh, now it be at the tail end of that three-year project and trying, we all tried so hard to think like a system. It's just, I just got to tell you, it's very difficult in, in our world to, to actually collaborate, cooperate, integrate, uh, and plan like a system. So this is uh, just some of the people in the project, some of the names in green. We didn't have photos at that time. but. Uh, it was a very diverse group, um, very intentionally diverse, diverse in discipline. If we're going to study a system, we needed uh, a, a lot of different academic disciplines. Um, if we were going to change anything, we needed not just academics, we needed the public agencies involved. We needed some of the nonprofits who were involved in gardening involved. We needed uh, some, a couple of very key uh, small businesses involved, and then we got some corporate folks involved, um, uh, sort of in a, in a loose way, but uh, they were helpful. We intended to bring them more on board but it, it, once we got uh, further down the road, but never quite got to that point. Um, but the plan, the, all that we really promised, for $200,000, all we really promised was a plan. That's all we had to do. I kept saying that, that was my man mantra, you know, all we got to do is a plan, that's all we got to do. So uh, it was a, kind of a strategic plan for a system. How do you, you know, it's one thing to do strategic planning for a firm or an organization, but try doing it for a system where no one, there's no boss thing about a system is there's no boss that says strategic planning 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Um, so why? why? Why do we care about food waste? Well, you don't have to go into the stats. I mean, basically, we waste a lot of food in America, a lot. And this is a, you know, we have a lot of hungry people, so there's a whole lot of, uh, of problems with, with food waste. Um, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, has, um, has been uh, <coughs> circulating this pyramid for a while. Right now, we um, we send, the pyramid's actually upside down. Right, right now, we're sending most of our food waste to the landfill. There's problems with that, I'll explain in a minute. Um, their first preference is that we reduce it in the first place. So, but in our, and you can see the other options. But in our project, we just narrowed our scope. We were only going to focus on um, composting, seeing how much we, could we compost, what would it take to compost more food waste, what would we do with that compost, what would pay for it all. Um, so uh, just going over why compost food waste. Well, landfills, they're very difficult to, it's very difficult to site new landfills. You've got to make the ones that you have last as long as possible. That's why we can't put our leaves in, in, in the landfill anymore, anywhere in the state of Wisconsin. But we can put our food waste in landfills. Some states you can't. A few very small number of states are no, long, no, uh, cities are no longer allowing that. Uh, I kind of highlighted in red what took me, became the most important problem for me. Agriculture is a huge source of methane. Food waste in landfills, which is really part of agriculture. Food waste is part of ag our agricultural system. Landfills are part of our agricultural system. Um, and so the, the methane that they produce, methane is something like 20, 22 times more power potent than uh, uh, carbon dioxide in terms of effect on, on climate. Um, and then some other reasons, and I'm just going to just get to, f I'm going to sh show a couple pictures of four and five. So our project wasn't only going to tackle food waste. That wasn't complex enough. We decided we also wanted to, uh, to address where there was hunger in the city of Milwaukee and, and how could we take that compost and get it onto soil so that people could grow food where it was either paved over or unhealthy or, or, or uh, not fertile enough to grow food. Um, and then this other problem, just kind of out of nowhere, you know, I didn't know before the project started, before the, the pre-proposal and the background literature review, that, that a whole other problem was going to come into play. And it turn out, turns out to be potentially the, 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 the key to solving it all. Um, so uh, we focused a lot of our attention on 10 zip codes, the 10 poorest of 30 or 31 zip codes uh, in Milwaukee. Um, most of those are on the north side, a couple on the south side. So we were, we were in, in Milwaukee. Um, this is what I was going to get to. So this is this problem that I didn't really realize was going to be part of the project. But in Milwaukee, a lot of older cities in America, they had, they, their sewage systems, water and sewer systems, were designed 100 years ago, back before we knew uh, better to, to separate stormwater from, say, uh, 
your household waste, you know, wastewater, t you know, toilets and everything else. Um, so what happens in Milwaukee in these older parts of the city is it's a real complex system here. Basically, if there's too much water, it's got no choice to, to, to flow both the sewage and the stormwater into Milwaukee's three rivers, which eventually goes into um, Lake Michigan. So why does that matter? I'll try to get that in a little bit. It's something called green infrastructure. Um, this is a slide. This is a piece of land. We found it very, very difficult to find places to compost on anything but a really small scale in the city of Milwaukee. You, you ideally, you want to compost. You want to compost food waste as close to the source, and you want to, and as close to the use of the compost, so that it doesn't have to move it around. It's heavy. Um, so we tried to find so places to, to compost in the city. Very hard. But this is actually just a slide to show this. Beginning at the problems, and this uh, in Google Slides that popped up very slowly. It was really pretty, but. Um, but this is, I had to transfer it to, to whatever, PDF. So these are silos. So you, everybody's heard, oh, too many silos, oh, we're a bunch of silos, oh, we gotta tear down these silos. Has anybody not heard that expression? Like a gazillion times. Um, so what, that's the problem we ran into in Milwaukee, is these silos, silos within silos, silos in academia, silos in, you know, how many silos are on this campus? How many people are on this campus? That's how many silos are on this campus. Um, so this was our goal, or our challenge. How do we get the silos to talk to each other, these different sectors of the economy in Milwaukee? And then this is one of the oldest uh, whatever uh, analogies in the world, uh, the blind man and the elephant. Supposedly, um, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha was the first one or one of the earliest people to use this, uh, this expression is, you know, in a system, some people, under, some people understand some parts very, very, very well. They're specialists. And then, but they have no idea how the other side of the elephant works. You know, and that's really, that's what, this, this, this is just found everywhere. It's in, it's in climate change and all the causes of climate change. And we were just finding this in this tiny little problem of how do we move food waste from landfills to composting and somehow utilize it. Uh, I talked about two entrepreneurs, Melissa Tajan. So she's just, Tajan, Tajan with a passion is how she describes herself. And she is running a, a small business. She's got four trucks, converted garbage trucks, and she runs around the city to households, to businesses, to grocery stores, to uh, you know, hotels, wh whoever is willing to go to the bother of transferring their food waste from the landfill, letting her take it. And where she takes it is to this guy's farm, a sixth generation family farm just south of uh, Milwaukee, very northern Racine County. This is James, how do you say this name? Yeah, we don't, he don't know either. Uh, we don't know. It, 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 no one in, I can't pronounce anyone's names in Milwaukee, but um, in any case, we tried to dumb down the system. We were talking to people who understood this side very well, but they didn't understand this and this. So we kind of had to dumb down the whole system so everybody could understand what we were talking about. And it's really very simple in a lot of ways. We're just trying to move food scraps, food scraps, food waste, into systems large and small that can compost it, and then do something with it that pays for the rest of this. And this is a picture of someone, have you ever heard of a blower truck? This is, there's a big semi out in the front of this house that's blowing compost through this tube onto this lawn, and that's called green infrastructure. So that water that's being, that's, the, the storms come, and it overwhelms the sewage systems, and they have to dump sewage into, the, uh, into Lake Michigan. Green infrastructure is ways to capture water, slow it down, uh, or, or stop it from going into that, that system. And the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District has made a commitment on paper. That's one thing we learned is uh, commitments on paper mean about as much as that piece of paper. But they made a commitment to one, spending $1 million a year on that, on green infrastructure. $1 million would pay, as you'll, I'll show in a minute, would pay for all of this. $1 million a year would pay for a, a, a great, a tremendous scaling up of this system if it happened. So what did we do? We did some academic research. So this is Tim Allen, Milwaukeean, uh, who moved to Madison, got his master's degree here. You know Tim Allen. He, he was in your slide, one of your slides. Um, and so he, did, he got his master's degree uh, with the, the, the funds from this project, and he did some great research for us, gathered a lot of data from some of these key players. We did maps. We collected more data. We did analysis of where would be the best places to site compost. We collected more data from gardens. How much do gardens need? Um, we made more mass, you know, and we did compost trials. We, we, did, we compared four, uh, three different compost product, products uh, on this man, David Johnson's farm on the north side. Um, we even got deeply involved in, in a pilot to spread compost on, on residence, residential yards in 35, household, uh, 35 homes. This side, 
I'll just say it bluntly as primarily white and upper, upper class or upper middle, middle class. This side, you, it's, you drive across this road and you just, in, a, in about four block span, the world changes. So this is Harambe and this is River West. And initially we had all of our houses on this side. I couldn't accept that. We'd, we had to make a lot of extra effort, but we got 10 more houses on this side and they all got free compost blown under their yard. It was a pilot trying to coax that MMSD to actually follow through and spend $1 million on, on, on this. Uh, so uh, we did a lot of drawing. When you're doing a complex system, it really helps to just sit down and start drawing it. And then event, over time, your, your drawings become more sophisticated to the point where you're actually plugging, <laughs> you're plugging real data into, this is a, this is a software tool. Um, it's very basic rudimentary modeling tool. Um, but we were able to plug real data into this, and this is basically showing red is, red is bad, red is danger. This is taking food waste out of the landfill, running it through these various types of food waste generators, food waste makers, um, uh, hospitals, you know, restaurants, residential homes, uh, grocery stores, etc. Running it through compost crusaders up there in the purple, that's the woman I showed you. She's sending it over here and it's getting combined with other food waste, so combining food waste, eventually combining it with yard waste, making a finished product and then getting into FNG, farms and gardens, and green infrastructure. And there were a couple, di several different players we were kind of mapping there. And we were able to run scenarios. We were able, our data was never good enough. We could never, people protect their data, they don't want to share their data, they have competitive reasons for not sh sharing their data, they're too busy. So the, the data was always subpar. But we were able in the end to actually, you know, I wouldn't necessarily bet my life on these numbers because it was just so difficult. But what we were able to find is if MMSD actually followed through and spends $1 million on, on soaking up rainwater, that would um, far exceed going from, this is actually, I think, 1%. Right now, most of Tajin is, is composting something like 1% of the food waste. She's, it's getting composted. We could go up to 8%. <coughs> And it would require, it would, we'd have to get rid of, we'd have to sell, use, pay for 4,221 4, cubic yards of compost. Well, more MMSD could do that five times over almost. Um, so convincing a public agency to follow through with their plan would pay for everything. Uh, and 8% might be enough because as EPA was saying, we should be reducing food in the first place, food waste in the first place. We should be getting it to people who are hungry. We should be getting it to animals to, to help agricultural uh, help farmers uh, lower their life, their, 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 uh, their feed costs. So we got to the point, we were creating the plan, and this, I'm almost done, we got to the point where we, were, we really had lined up who were the key players. There were a lot of other partners who weren't represented. We finally just had to get the right players in the room, get those public agency people. Um, we, had, we had some good meetings. You know, we finally got um, MMSD getting a little bit more serious, but this Department of Public Works and and the, the ECHO, the Ecolog uh, Environmental Collaboration Office, we really were getting very, very close. And in fact, just this year, um, the City of Milwaukee City Council approved $2.8 million for green infrastructure. So breakthrough, we finally had a breakthrough. The plan would have been very rudimentary, but we were ready to do it. It was close, we had started to pencil everything out. And then PFAS, anybody know what PFAS are? Anybody wanna say what PFAS are? What's the, who can pronounce what PFAS are? Steve can. It's hard. It's hard. It's a chemical, right? If you haven't heard of PFAS, you know that some of the fight over these uh, F-35s, is that what they are, these airplanes that are coming to town or may, may not come to town. But one of the things I think people have an issue with is they use PFAS to, you know, to clean or to keep ice off or whatever they do. PFAS are basically a, 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 me, a, a chemical that helps, what would be the word? anti-combustion, but also something about water. The, the thing is that they're putting, they're, they put, PFAS are in these bowls. Chipotle is trying to be a good company. They're having compostable bowls and that, that don't, that, you know, you don't want the soup to soak through the bowl onto your lap. So they put PFAS in there as just some, some not, not too dissimilar from what the airplanes, why the airplanes use it. It's just a method to just keep that soup off your lap. And, it, and it, 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 you know, they were doing it for the, you know, for all the right reasons. But this all happened, this all came out in the news this May, June, July, August. So we were this close to a plan. And now everybody's thinking, oh my God, th these are, you know, th we don't know a lot. We don't know for sure, but they're, they're linked to cancer. 
um, and with some research, and they, we don't even know the half-life of these things, at least 500 years. So Milwaukee's sitting there, I'm in the city hall, we're in the mayor's conference room uh, for the final meeting of the project, and they're saying, you know, now we got all, this, all these PFAS concentrated on James's farm, do we really want to go spreading them all over the city of Milwaukee? So the whole system's kind of fallen apart because now there's no longer a buyer at the end to pay for it. But I believe actually the city's actually going to do their very best to figure out how can we use them. Can we put these PFAS in, a pla in places where they're not going to do food production? If we're just trying to soak up rainwater, there might be places that that would be okay. Um, and then really most of these PFAS I believe are going to be, uh, they'll be removed from the system. It might take a couple of years. But I, I believe that the, um, that the will is there to do this. I think Milwaukee is, uh, there's other cities that are ahead of Milwaukee, but there's a lot of places that are far behind. Where my, Madison, I would say, is not as far as Milwaukee right now in terms of thinking these things through and trying to make this happen. So um, that's, I think, it. Oh, and if, if you, I think you, you might have been asked to read an article about collective impact. Unfortunately, Steve, t I, I thought we'd have more than 15 minutes. I probably already ran over. Um, so I'm just going to, there, there you see it. There he goes. That was that. So uh, what would it look like if UW-Madison became world-renowned for inter interdisciplinary, multi-sector systems research to call, solve complex problems? If anybody's willing to say that we're already there, I would disagree. I don't think we are there. And I, I don't even know if there's a, what university in the world could actually claim this right now. I don't think we're doing much. I don't think we're doing anywhere near enough interdisciplinary systems research. We've got a lot of departments, we've got a lot of silos, and we're not doing this right now. But we could. We could. We've got all the talent on this campus to do it. So that's all I got. Oops. I'm whispering into a microphone. <laughs> yeah. So uh, really honored to uh, pull up the rear and to talk about um, what is important. All right, you didn't see my password, did you? Um, so what's really important to me um, in talking and thinking about the Wisconsin idea is the role of community engagement. So Steve uh, took a little bit of my thunder. I'm hoping to bring it on home. Uh, <clears throat> but I mentioned this. Um, it's funny that we're on this panel together because Greg is right. He, um, I was teaching at Wayne State at the time. I was the president of the board of directors of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. And Greg reached out to us and said, hey, we got some money. We want to do some projects, and how can we get you on board? I still apologize to Greg because we were kind of brutal. <laughs> Not brutal in a disrespectful way, but really just sort of saying that the role and the voice of community organizations is important and shouldn't just be important after you get the money. It should be important as we construct the research topics and the questions. And so when I thought about the role and significance of the um, community engagement and the Wisconsin idea, it was important for me just to sort of show you how much richer my scholarship is as a result of interacting and engaging with community, um, just to encourage us to not think about the Wisconsin idea as a unilateral dis the direction, right, a relationship, right? So it isn't just scholars here in Madison sharing our interests and research with the world, but really is about how do we engage and establish relationships with community to understand what is their view of the social condition, and then how might we together collaboratively work together to, to fix, uh, to respond to these questions. So uh, I talk about freedom farmers, and uh, Benjamin Card describes who freedom farmers for me, uh, who they are. The reason I've always wanted to be a farmer is because I believe then and believe now that the farmer is the only free man we have in our race. Another farmer that I work with, he says, you can free yourself when you can feed yourself. So to think about the power of that statement coming from black farmers in the South, but also understanding that folks in Detroit were also grappling with a declining infrastructure and a failure to re access research, uh, nutrient-rich food sources. Um, as some might say, food, healthy food, organic food was beyond the tofu curtain. 
meaning that it was either beyond their um, regional economic um, transportation, uh, that you know, healthy food was somewhere else for someone else. And so community members in Detroit decided that they would take matters into their own hands and create a, an alternative or create a community-based food system. And it was in the space of this work, of working with the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, we had D-Town Farm, a seven-acre organic farm. Uh, we're in the process of the Detroit People's Food Co-op that I received some funding. Baba Malik Yakini was in Steve's presentation. But as a researcher, I really wanted to sort of what was important to me wasn't the shape and frame of how the, the academy talked about food access and food insecurity. What I really wanted to understand is how do people that live in a food insecure community, how do they respond to increasing access to nutrient rich food? So the contrast between the two would be something like this. Um, this is an important, well, an award winning uh, journalist who wrote a book about Detroit calling Detroit uh, an American autopsy. Well, if you know anybody from Detroit, you know we love the 313, baby. And so what does that love mean? It means that for you to call something, to, to call for an autopsy, that means that something is what? Well, tell that to the 665,000 folks who are there, who live there, who work there, who believe in Detroit. And so this, to me, um, suggests what is often a research approach or an academic approach, which is what is the social problem? And that usually centers on a deficit model. So say, for example, I, you come to my house, and you walk in the door, and you say, well, that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong. How does that make me feel? Opposed to saying, every community, every entity has something upon which to build, some assets. So if we start with the assets, then we can think about what are logical solutions. We're hearing from the voices of those who live in food insecure communities, and there's a whole different orientation to how we engage communities, how we approach our research questions, and how we do our scholarship. And so instead of thinking of Detroit as an autopsy or ready for autopsy, can we think about it as compost? This is passion, and passion has an organization called Detroit Dirt. They take zoo poop and transform the zoo poop into nutrient-rich soil, and they pass it around to various community projects and entities. And so instead of an autopsy, can it not be compost? That the previous iteration of a city then provides the nutrients for what a new vision of a city based on agriculture, creating a sustainable food system, what might that be? Now, for those of you that are students, here is the punch. These answers didn't come from the academy. There was no class that taught me this. There were no lectures that offered this. It was in working hand in hand as a member of the organization that I had my own level of education that taught me about language such as food sovereignty, food security, what were the differences, what are community-based strategies. And so it was in conversation and building and working with folks that my own awareness was able to sort of think about how might my scholarship help the movement Instead of me going and saying, you know what, I read this theory, here's what you need to do. That wasn't my approach. I looked at what people were doing. I wanted to understand, have there been other moments when black folks particularly have turned to agriculture as a strategy of resistance and resilience? And the outcome is working toward community health and wellness. And so that led to some research questions. How have black farmers organized in collectives and cooperatives as a strategy against racial and economic oppression? How might cooperatives function within food justice communities in an effort to work toward community wellness? I also asked the question, how does agriculture, as people who do this food work, as they understand it, offer us a different way of thinking about resistance, resistance, and, uh, resistance to economic, political, and social oppression? And so, of course, any good scholar will tell you, you have a research question. I was working in Detroit looking to see what was going on, and I wanted to sort of understand, what does the scholarship say about um, black agriculture? And how might this be a different, how might this offer a different way to understand this? And so, what I found was the majority of the scholarship suffers from what Jimenanda Adichie calls the danger of a single story. And the danger of the single story means that most often we get hooked onto something that feels good, sounds good, makes it easy, but is really incomplete. In other words, understand the, the relationship between agriculture and African Americans particularly, we often think about slavery, tenant farming, and sharecropping, full stop. 
That can't be the only reason that, the only way to understand why black folks farm and grow food. And so in order for us to do an expansive sort of understanding, there are other ways that we need to think about this. So in the same ways that agriculture has been oppressive, it is also, for those who do it, has also been liberatory. Benjamin Carr told us this. We think about migration, the black migration, as resulting from um, you know, the need to get away from the South and not wanting to do the work. And I argue that that's not really what happened. It was the exploitive, oppressive conditions, and folks were willing to work, but working all season and then coming out at the end of the season and still owing in the hole and not able to provide for your family, that's what people were walking away from. The legal system offered no recourse. The political system offered no recourse. There was no place where the people felt could hear what they were saying, and therefore, that's the reason for the migration. So I really think that Looking at changing that frame, one from oppressive to one that is liberatory, allows us to think differently about the stories we tell and the stories we hear. But I could not have done that had I not had my ear to community. And last, I think, you know, as I mentioned already, the danger of the single story means that other voices, other narratives are muted. And then people feel like, well, we already know the answer. But when you listen to community and you hear the ways that they're engaging agriculture, as I said, it didn't happen in the, in the academy. It happened in community organizations. The questions they were asking, I was like, well, shoot, I've never, what in the, how, have, wait, stop. This is really something. You guys are on to something. And how might I use my role as an academic to elevate their voices, elevate their strategies, and talk and think differently about black folks' relationship to agriculture and the land? So, I mean, in thinking about social movement strategies broadly, um, Rojas, while even he was talking about black studies departments and black students' um, protests, describes social movement strategies as disruptive versus non-disruptive. So one example of disruptive is, I'm going to boycott, um, or protest in front of your establishment, which means I'm going to stop the flow of capital, right? And so this is disruptive. A non-disruptive strategy might be a hunger strike or some way, a red ribbon around, right? So it's not disruptive, it's not stopping your business, but it is a protest moment. Uh, everyday resistance, Scott and Kelly sort of talk about the ways that people have a, uh, um, a feeling that something, they're being taken advantage of, they're being exploited, and they do things to counteract um, that, that feeling, that response. And what I would say is, while valuable and important, these are sort of protest moments, I think that they didn't, I don't think that they fully talked about resistance as having a political frame. It was, I'm mad, something's wrong, I'm going to do something, throw a monkey wrench in the system, but it doesn't allow for those who resist to have a political frame to understand what was happening, to articulate that. Uh, my dear friend uh, Bahati Kaumba at Spelman talks about gendered strategies and the reality that women are often excluded from political process and from even the social movement organization's leadership. And we can look at the civil rights movement and look at who are the voices that we elevated and who are the people that did a whole lot of the work. They were women. And so she argues that while women are involved in other strategies and moments of protest, women were also creating these spaces that were specifically women for women. So you may have a breastfeeding to protest laws against women breastfeeding. Of a case in Nigeria where women were speaking out against the shell company and their threat was to just disrobe, which is a sign of such disrespect that they could, I mean, you know, so it's using power within our spheres of influence um, as women. Um, and my argument is that in listening to communities and how communities organize and how agriculture offers us a different way, a different frame to articulate resistance, I offer collective agency and community resilience, which I'll talk about. So if we think about the previous examples of resistance strategies, disruptive, non-disruptive, everyday, and gendered, this may be gendered, but I don't know. Let's see. Does it, let's see if we can get this to work. Ja. En had ze dat, waar had ze dat gedaan? In dit, op het slavenschip of in Paramaribo of in Afrika? In Afrika. Oké, okay. ja, dat wil ik vandaag. Ja, ik wil het 
So this process So uh, what she's describing is that um, we braided seeds in our hair and carried them over from the middle passage. And why is this important? This is important because these seeds were seeds that were foods that we that, that were part of our culture. And it was important for us to bring that contraband and the way that we could do that. So black women's hair has always been political. And this is only one reason, right? So, I mean, this is one of many. And so understanding this need to bring culture, we're going on a long trip, we don't know where we're going to be. This rice from West Africa ended up providing a whole industry here, um, uh, a series of crops in the U.S. And so how did they, I mean, so some of the food that we brought was here uh, as a cultural celebration, but also understanding that it was the Africans who had the agricultural knowledge that even kept their enslavers alive. I think that is really important. So how then do we understand resistance using the frames that we had and I feel like we fall short? And I would not have known about this frame had it not been for community engagement. Ooh. Okay, sorry. Oh no. Okay, how do we progress this thing? Okay. Ooh. All right. So the methodology for my scholarship and how do I engage in communities in particular kinds of ways. Well, originally, because I was in Detroit working with the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, before I did any data collection, I attended a whole bunch of meetings. Uh, I wanted to hear and see what are people talking about, what does it mean, how are they organizing, and what does the depopulation of an urban area have um, uh, how does that encourage people to engage in food production as a strategy of resistance and resilience? So that required um, just sitting, attending meetings, and what have you. Um, I also did primary archival and secondary sources, uh, provided the material for the book. Um, additionally, I did lots of interviews, so I would spend the day uh, in the archives, and at night I would find black farmers, because often I found that it wasn't clearly as easy as the documents presented, and so there were some points where I needed some guidance and some direction. How do I understand the legacy of Booker T. Washington versus George Washington Carver? How do we engage this work, and what was the history of these cooperative organizations and what have you. And so um, originally the book was going to be from 1880 to 2013. And my dear friend Suniyata Chaju at the University of Illinois, he was like, Mo, you're never going to get tenure. You can't write a book that long on black agriculture. So what I did was I concentrated on the organizations. Um, I kept a, 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 um, a roll of the different kinds of activities, various cooperatives and collectives. What did they do? And then how do we categorize that? And then I concentrated for the book on um, three specific organizations um, uh, historically, um, but uh, was able to sort of use their strategies and articulate that, and that was the foundation for understanding uh, collective agency and community resilience. So I think when you think about community engagement in the Wisconsin idea, um, the origin of the research question came from the community. Members of the organization were doing the work, and I wanted to understand other examples. Is something wrong? Okay. Oh, is it too loud? Okay. I'll whisper. Okay. Uh, so the origin of the question, like I wanted to make sure that my scholarship was useful to the folks in Detroit who were doing the work. And so I didn't come in and say, hey, I have a research question. I said, I just have an idea. I want to understand why black folks are returning to agriculture. And then it was through this asking and sitting and listening, I was able to develop the research questions. Um, uh, an engaged research methodology means that at all points, I was asking people, what is it, you know, in addition to um, um, clarifying any questions that I had with the data, I also wanted to make sure that there was um, honesty in the idea and the essence of the work that they were doing. Um, I think, as I mentioned, you can have two different kinds of approaches. You can have one that starts with assets and everyone feels richer because of it, or you can start with the deficit approach, which actually does leave um, uh, a lot of stones unturned. Um, and, you know, community responses and engagement. I always take my data back, and anyone who's been interviewed or anyone who's worked, I ask them to read it. Am I true to the data? Am I true to the essence of the ideas that you have? And then the question I often ask, if I don't have any skin in the game, I wonder if it's my fight. Um, it is important for us to articulate and to do the work, but also making sure that we have our own 
own reasons for why we're engaging this work that is respectful and uh, honor and, and engagement. This leaves you open to vulnerability. Um, I don't know how nice we were to Greg. He forgave me. <laughs> but we were really challenging. And I think that that vulnerability is a part of what it is that we do in terms of the academy. Uh, we can't be afraid for someone to say, if you're not in food insecure, then how can you study food insecurity? I have to be okay with answering that question. You're a professor, and what, how does this relate to what it is that you do? And so also understanding that questions of class, race, gender may be asked, and I owe the community to answer those questions in a way um, that, that is respectful. Um, there are ways that we work toward acceptance and challenges. I think that there's a richness and a depth of the data that cannot be achieved without engaging uh, community. Community. And the solutions, I think in the same way that we can talk about every community having something upon which to build, I truly believe that within every community is the answer to those problems. It's just a matter of how do we engage, how do we interact to actually articulate them and connect them to the broader questions. Booker T. Washington said, no race can prosper till it learns that there is as much dignity in tilling a field as in writing a poem. He agrees. So here are some of the solutions. This is, and, and the folks who were involved in this were absolutely convinced that, there, that this was food justice, this was organizing, and this was creating and making a way out of no way. But if you paid attention only to the scholarship, you would miss all of these moments. Uh, this is the G's Bin. This is a cooperative store. Uh, the reason that this was resistance is because often when folks did register to vote or went to attempt to register to vote, they would either be killed fired and evicted from the land. But a cooperative and having cooperative stores allowed them to get resources at a fair price. Um, and this for them was a strategy of uh, resistance. Oops, sorry, a little pep talks. This is a sign of resistance. Uh, these are the homes that Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer built. Um, we had gone from very shacks and shanties and her effort in Freedom Farm Agricultural Cooperative was an effort to make sure that folks had houses and with heat and you know the resources and, and they were able to do that together. This is Mrs. Hamer at the cooperative store. So for her, not only was it important that you were nutrit uh, fed, fed nutritious food, but that the whole community was fed nutritious food. And she really emphasized there should be no single ownership. It should all be collective. Dara Cooper, the National Black Food and Justice Alliance says, individually, farmers are vulnerable. Collectively, we have power. And so realizing that not just caring for myself is important, but caring for my community is important. These are the ideas that came from my work in community engagement. Here are some solutionaries. This is the Federation of Southern Cooperatives installing solar panels. Here, are, they're installing a solar water heater. Wait a minute now. Solar water heater, it's 2019, and we still aren't doing solar water heaters. So I'm telling you that there are solutions that community members have been talking about, have been working on, and if we don't pay attention to, commu to community, we really miss the nuance and the essence of what's going on. Here's a print, uh, printing press. They, they articulated the, the idea that one thing, you know, you, an area that you could be vulnerable is how you get your message out. But if we're in control of that, then that's a sign of our power. That is a strategy of resistance. So collective agency and community resilience, after I collected all the data, I analyzed the theoretical framework. For those of you who have heard it, forgive me. Uh, but agency is often studied as a psychological construct. But how do we understand when communities come together to transform a neighborhood? We often think about resilience as what happens when a community fights back against a catastrophic event. And that is respectable. But to do that without pushing against the structural factors that leave some communities vulnerable is irresponsible. So we can talk about, yes, we had this hurricane, and people came to feed one another, to house one another, to clothe one another. But if we don't, then take the next step that says, and how do we respond to the vulnerability that means those in Puerto Rico, are, you know, those that, you know what I'm saying? So it, how do we then push against the structural forces? Commons as Praxis just articulates the ways these cooperatives and organizations function. They believe that it was important for us to have shared decision making in how our resources are used. If we all drink water, we should all have some say in what we put in the water and how we use the water. We should have government shared governance when it comes to seas, to land, to air, and what have you. And I think prefigurative politics, uh, not my phrase, it's acting as if. So we know that there are lots of efforts to disenfranchise black folks from the right to vote. 
And so within these organizations, it was one person, one vote, and therefore it was not only a safe space where they could also sort of think about um, ways, strategies, and educate political alternatives, but it was also important for us to say, my vote matters, my vote counts, it counts in this organization, and we're working toward making sure there's full inclusion in the social political process. And economic autonomy and independence is another series of strategies that many of these organizations come up with either alternative economic um, exchange, they don't use a dollar, it may be a dollar's worth of labor for a dollar's worth of labor. When we use salary, we then value some over others. But for economic autonomy, my tutoring your child is just important, just as important as you um, working on my teeth. Right? So we don't place a value over labor based upon some sense of elitism, but one hour's worth of labor is one hour's worth of labor. So, Bell Hooks says, collective black self-recovery takes place when we begin to renew our relationship to the earth, when we remember the way of our ancestors. Living in modern society without history has been easy to forget. Black people were first and foremost people of the land, farmers. I just feel like it's important for us to sort of honor and understand, appreciate this component, this aspect, because I would not have been led to bell hooks and the farmers of DBCFSN if I was only using the lens of the academy to tell me what resistance looks like. And so, for Detroiters, this is resistance. This is resistance. This is, a resi is resistance. And we truly believe that our babies deserve to be superheroes. Thank you. Our, um, questions. And listening to the presentations tonight, along with those we've had before, it occurred to me that we could probably have named this set that the emphasis for the entire course would be on engagement. Because that is really what the Wisconsin idea has, was focusing on. How do we get people engaged, engaged with communities, engaged with the worlds that surround them? Engage with, as this group has said, uh, with the education, research, the outreach, and advocacy. So this kind of an activity does, in fact, emphasize the idea that there can be engagement with significant kinds of consequences. Again, if there were time, I'd tell you more about some of those fascinating posts that have been put up following different lectures, following the one on limnology. There was someone who was so moved that she went immediately after, afterwards to join in on one of the laboratories that had been discussed. This idea of, I can in fact engage. The same thing that happened with people as they listened to discussions about disability disabilities, people who talked about the McBurney Center that they didn't even know that much about beforehand, people who heard about the lectures on education in the classroom who said, I know that our job as students, as members of the community, our job is to try to engage and especially engage in ways that we learn from others, broaden our perspectives, and in fact enhance the world we live in. But I said, it's time for questions of our presenters. So let me see what questions anyone has um, for the evening. Of any? No? Okay. Yeah, uh, OK. Sure. Stand up anyway. Yes, all three of you. Um, hi, thank you very much for an interesting, uh, very interesting presentation. And uh, for, the, uh, for the third part of presentation, the, thir uh, the last part of presentation, um, I just want to, um, please cor correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, so there are two ways to approach the community. One of them is asset-based asset approach, and the other one is um, deficit-based <coughs> approach. So could you elaborate more on these two approaches? Sure. Um, so I, I think in grad school we spend a lot of time talking about what is the statement of the problem? So if you think about that problem, it's already articulating that you're look in search of something wrong. Now that's not how we do it, but it is what we end up doing, right? And so if we say what is the statement of the problem, then that leads us to looking at a deficit approach, what's wrong with 
communities. And I think it gives us a sense of elitism that we are the ones with the answers and we're the ones who are best qualified to respond to resolve everything if, ever, if the world would just listen to us. My argument is there are some questions and answers that do come from the academy. But in order to understand how the richness and the depth and breadth of, of people's lived experience, we have to elevate those voices from, you know, the voices of those who experience it. And I can tell you, we can tell you what, when things go wrong. For example, the folks in Flint told us for years that the water was bad. How long did it take for academics to get in and to, to there was citizen science going on. You know, folks were saying there's something wrong. And so we weren't listening. So part of it is that we don't listen. Part of it is that we come in with our own answers, our own solutions. And I think that all of these are problems that take place outside of true engagement. Um, and when we truly engage, then we're looking for not just what is wrong, what isn't working, but we're starting from a place that there has to be something upon which we can build. And there are solutions in that community, and I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so I have a question around this uh, topic of community engagement and the academy. What are the institutional... Um, expectations and uh, reinforcements and incentives for having it be a two-way flow information out and input coming into our institution to help set priorities to inform the work we do the questions we ask is that for that's for all three of you <laughs> Let me give one response to that. Uh, the incentives are not very good. Uh, there is an organization called the Mortgage Center for Public Service on this campus that does provide some support for engaged scholarship, uh, but the usual re reward system, uh, things like tenure and post-tenure review, uh, do not very well recognize either public service or uh, community engaged scholarship. Uh, we have some folks that are working on changing that and I hope that uh, within the near future uh, that in at least tenure guidelines there is explicit recognition both of uh, engaged scholarship and uh, service to the university and to the community. Hopefully that's something that will do a better job, at least we're aware of the efficiency at this point. Well, I'll just take the asset approach. Right, and uh, you know, I've worked in extension my whole career, and I think it's a fantastic system. You know, I think had we not invented that 100 years ago, we would have to invent it now, because it's what, it's what works. And uh, it's, it's in every single county. Um, I think it's fantastic in many ways, and it is doing engagement. I mean, those county workers out there are doing pretty much just exactly what we, we, we've asked them to do. It, it, it's, it is engagement. And the, my favorite faculty that I've worked with over the years, present party excluded, um, I've been extension specialists. You know, the, the faculty who have extension appointments, they've they're always been so easy to approach. You know, you know, people like Scott Rankin, chair of the Dairy, Dairy Science Department. I mean, you, I, I, I could always go to them for help, especially if it was to help someone at, 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 you know, at a county level or in a community. So. I think it's, we, we are halfway there, you know, or at least halfway there already, so just got to keep extension. Yeah, we only have time for a couple of Oh, can I, can, can yes. I, okay, so just really quickly, I think the majority of my career, I have done the community work outside of the institution, and there were lots of times, I couldn't even tell my departments the kind of work I was doing in community because they were telling me that I was using my time, I was mismanaging my time. So it wasn't until I got here that I was able to be in a place that honored and appreciated my work in community and actually encouraged it. I think there's some engaged scholarship uh, components that are working their way through the tenure um, and promotion. But it was a separate full-time job. I was running 
three hour meetings uh, in Detroit as a board member from my apartment, my house in Madison. And I mean, you know, so there was a lot that in addition to the teaching research and service, there were also ways that I was and it hasn't always been valued and appreciated. So I do think that as an as a university, there are some ways that we need to be thinking about how to really, truly honor and create the opportunities and the spaces for students and faculty to do more of this work, but also make sure that it counts when it counts, which is tenure promotion grants and what have you. We can't ignore that and say, yeah, community, community. But then when I'm coming up, having worked in community, say, yeah, but that doesn't count. I think we probably only have time for about one more question. Oh. Um, right. Thank you. Uh, how important is it and in what ways that funding for the projects mentioned specifically tonight come from federal sources, the USDA or the NIH, as opposed to private sources, uh, say the Whole Foods Foundation, or doesn't matter? Um, in some senses, money is money. Um, the advantage of the federal sources is there are mechanisms in place to amplify those messages. Uh, to, uh, there are tools of dissemination that are kind of built in. Um, the disadvantage is that the federal government is a huge bureaucracy, and particularly in working with community organizations, that bureaucracy uh, actually is quite an impediment at times. I'm afraid that's going to have to be our last question of the night, although the speakers probably will be able to talk with many of you informally now that we're wrapping up. The last comment I would have to make is that I thought I heard comments about incompleteness as Professor White talked about the incompleteness if it's based on a single story, and that's not the full picture there. The incompleteness in trying to understand systems that are there. But also, there is a situation that's incomplete because the Wisconsin idea we know has to continually be reinforced, examined, so we're not at the end of the semester, nor are we at the end of examining the Wisconsin idea. Thanks to all of you.